Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices in the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Vary. And today we're joined by Travis Dial, co-founder and CEO of Cobalt Robotics. And we're going to be talking about, I guess, what I would characterize Travis as the engineer's guide to product development. There's a lot of great ideas out there, but bringing them to, to life, turning them into a company is hard work. Um, excited to talk about it. Travis, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. So uh, table stakes, let's start with, for those that don't know, Cobalt is you know one of the darlings of the robotics space, uh, but not everyone might know you guys. Can you give us a little background? Yeah, so Cobalt Robotics, we provide safety and security and facilities management functions for large corporate clients. Um, and we happen to do that by way of this five foot tall mobile robot, where this robot does things like security patrols in lieu of a guard, or safety observation tours for facilities managers. And basically this robot is going around doing these routine checks, these really basic automated tasks. It's building a model of what is normal and then looking for anomalies, right? It, which could be like people, motion, sounds, leaks and spills, open doors. And it's flagging these for a remote operator to come in and be able to respond to them in real time. And so we ultimately help these large commercial clients manage their global real estate footprint uh, from the comfort of their own home. And by doing this, we're able to provide a much better service at a much cheaper cost and provide a lot of value across the entire organization. So one of the things that stands out about you guys, and I, I think one of the reasons that you've had a lot of success is you think about things, um, you seem to almost obsess about things through the customer lens. Um, so it's this is not about, hey, here's a cool technology, let's find a solution. It's about identifying problems and then building the technology. I, I think this right here is, is, a, is like one of the junctions that companies uh, run into trouble, you know, because you can't go backwards in time and establish product market fit. You either got it or you don't. Talk to me about origin stories. Like, what did this look like for you guys in the early days? Um, did you start out with this product? You know, give us a little background on you, your co-founder, and how you guys approach this. And and like answer through the lens, if you can, of uh, an engineer out there that is looking to replicate in a different space what you guys have pulled off. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess for background, I am a technologist, right? I did my PhD building big robots, like robots the size of people with arms. Uh, I think I was the first person to have a full-size robot in my own house. Um, it was picking things up off the ground, turning on and off the lights, you know, having epic failures due to my cats running around. Uh, and, and so, you know, a big part of our emphasis during grad school was getting robots out of the lab and in the human environments. Things like fetching and delivering medication to older adults or helping quadriplegics shave their face. But as I finished my graduate work, I had this realization that a lot of roboticists build robots for the sake of building cool robots, right? Kind of that like Boston Dynamics effect, if you will. Um, and that was especially true at the time. And so I actually left robotics altogether, spent a decade building medical devices, right? Everything from cyborg dragonflies, like literally custom chips hooked into the brains of living dragonflies to read out their brain signals. Or I spent time at Google X and their life sciences group. But back in 2016, uh, a buddy of mine, Eric, who is a you know, SpaceX alum, we've known each other for a long time. We sat down and we started sitting down with people outside of technology, like people that, you know, in more traditional industries. And we literally asked them, if you could wave a magic wand and have us solve a problem for you, what would you have us do? Now, Eric and I had a few criteria we were looking for in the types of problems we wanted to solve. This was things like uh, product to market in a year meaning no long-term R&D. It was things like uh, paying customers before we build anything, right? Are we solving a real business problem? One of our criteria was software only, which clearly we failed at. We're building a 125 pound mobile robot. Uh, but we, we understand that like software is a huge leverage point. And in this case, you know, hardware is a means to that end. And then finally, it was finding something that we could see ourselves doing and loving for the next decade. And so with, with these kind of criteria in mind, one of the people that we spoke with was an old friend who was the global head of safety and security at this giant multinational tech company. And we asked him that question, like, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you have us do? And he asked us point blank, why can't you take those robots you were building 15 years ago and use them for security? 
specifically, like if I think of, you know, the swing shift, the grave shift weekends, basically nights and weekends, he was employing, you know, an insane number of, of security officers to be walking around these mostly empty buildings, just doing these basic guard tour checks. And he's like, it's not cost effective. It's not particularly high quality. We'd really like a better solution. I think I've been saying for 20 years, these robots should be the solution. Why can't we do that? Now, if I'm being honest, our first inclination was like, you're crazy. Why would you ever want a robot doing this? Like you should just put cameras everywhere and like robots can't tackle bad guys. And thankfully he was super patient with us <laughs> um, and introduced us to a lot of his peers who, who confirmed these exact thinking was that, you know, access control and cameras, two quintessential IoT technologies, uh, are great for what they do, but they don't solve everything. Even though they're getting better, they don't solve everything. They have limited field of view. They're very you know, specific in where and how they're deployed, which is why like these American companies spend $50 billion on guards. And so it was basically working directly with them that we just purpose built this solution to be able to provide guard tour-like capabilities uh, through the mobile robot. And it was just this constant evolution working directly with those early customers to ultimately achieve that goal. We had our first paid deployment within one year of the company's founding. Um, we had paying customers before we built it. It was obviously not software only, <laughs> um, but it also speaks to this long-term uh, vision of having robots help automate uh, many of these basic tasks um, to turn the physical world into process automation in the same way that systems like UiPath and others do RPA for you know computer tasks. Um, we now can do that for for many of these these physical physical applications. The the paying customers one is such an interesting standout. Um, I, I think especially for a hardware company, getting early revenue such an important signal. What did that look like for you guys? Um, in the early days, you know, was there a high willingness to pay? So you had these conversations, you're asking people, what should we solve? I think you quickly got feedback that cameras, which I think, I think most people would assume, Hey, why does cobalt exist? Just doesn't Google make great cameras and you can spot bad guys and you guys, you know, have uncovered, Hey, look, no, like there's a $50 billion need for security guards. Um, talk a little bit about the, Paying customers piece. What did that look like? Was that slam dunk, super hard, somewhere in the middle? Well, so it, it, somewhere in the middle for sure. Um, so in the security world, one nice thing. So I, I grew up in the Midwest, right? I, I grew up in, in rural Nebraska. And in, in that area, like a handshake is as good as a signed contract and probably even more impactful. And so with, with the security professionals we work with, they operate in very much the same way, right? Like your reputation, your handshake, your commitment means a lot. And so for them, like this, the paying customers was, was handshakes, right? Um, it wasn't like we went and got advanced contracts with these folks, but we had very strong confidence that they were real. Um, and so they said, yeah, you build it, we will pay for it. Um, and so when we had our first units ready to go, you know, within that first year, and there was still a lot of duct tape and bailing wire inside those first systems, right? They were not like mass, mass production ready by any means. Um, and it was really just like understanding and making sure that you were actually solving a problem people would pay for, that they'd put their money where their mouth is, they'd serve as, as references when you're doing fundraising and things like that. Like they're putting their reputation on the line. And a lot of the buyers that you'll find in these more traditional industries, and to be clear, like we are a services company. We provide safety and security services, not, we don't sell robots. That's not at all what we do, right? It's about the data and the outcomes and the security capability. And so, for them to get them to sign up and, and put their reputation to deploy these technologies, it's a big deal because they're super pragmatic buyers. They don't tend to be early adopters on technology. And these operational enhancements that you're deplo deploying tend to be the most profound places where t that are underserved by technology today. And so I think you have to really go in and think of yourself as playing operational money ball, not as just being like a technology product. Um, because it is helping them enhance their their operations. Operational money ball. I love yeah. it. So, okay, let's stay on that for a second. In you, I've heard you use the term, never heard you say operational money ball, um, I, that, which is fantastic. 
I have heard you describe Cobalt before as enhancing operations, like customer operations with technology. And, and I've heard, you know, many times, and we have a lot of people on the program that say, look, we are not a hardware company. We provide hardware as a service to solve a problem. I know that's something you subscribe heavily to. Obviously, you just referenced it. Can you talk about you guys' vision of, you know, this enhancing operations through technology? What does that look like? And plain speak that for folks at home. What does that practically mean um, to Travis, you know, for customers? Yeah, so if, you, if, you, if you're a security director today, right, for the last 60 years, you've had the same three tools on your tool belt. You've had man guards, cameras, and door locks, right, like access control. And so when we come in and we have a new capability, like a totally new capability where it's, it's these mobile robots going around, it's basically like ending up with a new tool. And so there's this big question of how, when, where do you deploy these things to craft your perfect masterpiece, right? And so a lot of what we do is, is helping educate and design a modern security program with people to make sure that you're deploying humans where it makes sense and then robots everywhere else or technology everywhere else. Um, and so this really is like when for our company's composition, like, yes, there's a core engineering contingent, but a lot of our company are operations people. It's people that are, you know, former security, chief security officers, former military, former police and three letter agencies. And they are working directly with their counterparts to operationalize these new technologies to make sure that their, their program operates more effectively. And so that's why I tend to think of it as operational money ball is because you can't go in and just say like, we have an end all be all solution for all problems. It has to fit into their default MO. And so when you look at what we actually provide, in our case, it's, it's a, a bit more of an art form than a science, right? Because security is this amorphous thing that is, is based on your company's posture and your, the level of resources you have. Some of these other robot applications are even more straightforward, right? Like if you're doing landscaping and you are cutting the grass, the grass is either cut or it's not. Like the customer, by and large, doesn't really care how the grass gets cut. They just want it cut at a price point that is reasonable. Um, and so it really is looking at, at these applications in that way. It's like, what is the end outcome that you provide? And then can you do it more effectively? And for most of these, most of these applications, it is a cost center, right? Like security is a cost center. Landscaping is a cost center. Um, many of these things are cost centers. Now there are obviously like guard companies and things where it's revenue generating. And that, that's maybe an interesting tangent. But um, for most of these, it's how do you do something better, more cost effective, um, with better outcomes. It's that like 10x improvement in, in the status quo. Interesting. So Travis, it, the lawnmower example really brings it home. And it feels like, you know, a lot of companies are maybe not as unique as they're being treated. Our mutual friend, Paul Willard, talks about robotics as a service, the idea that these technology companies aren't hardware companies, or at least their product isn't hardware. Their product is the service that they uh, that they provide. What's your view on this beyond just cobalt? You know, is this something that you see coming and growing? Um, and it, it seems like you're suggesting this has actually been this way for quite some time. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of the low-hanging fruit for automation is really around services. And so for many of these end applications, there is a natural uh, service-based model that can be deployed, right? So for security, for example, we are tying into OPEX budgets, not CAPEX budgets. And so for us, it's a natural way to provide this, the, the ongoing service that has a bunch of unique benefits for us, right? Like obviously the e economics of recurring revenue are fantastic. Um, it, there's a natural pathway to uh, upgrade and avoid backwards compatibility to get rid of the, uh, the tendency for planned obsolescence. Like our goal is since we control end-to-end -end life cycle of that piece of hardware, like it's on us to optimize it and make sure that we're doing all the right things and, and delivering a quality service. And so I think there's a lot of these natural flywheels and feedback loops that you get. Um, that being said, it's really important to marry the business model to the way in which people consume the product. So like, like I said, you know, lawn care is a great example. Security is a great example. Window washing is a great example. Like there's a bunch of these that are good examples for robots as a service, but there's a lot that are really wrong. <laughs> um, so, you know, people are always coming to us pitching saying like, hey, you should do batteries as a service or sensing as a service, 
planning as a service, mapping as a service. Um, and it, we added it up one time. Like if we took all of these service providers and like bolted them together to make our product, we would have to be charging like 5x what we do and the entire company wouldn't work. Um, so I, I think it's really important. There's this, yeah, there's a natural tendency to match the business model with the, the, the actual product that you provide. Yeah, if you want to be successful. Um, Apple just announced seven days ago, as of today, March 31st, that they are beginning to experiment with hardware as a service. This is something that I think, I don't know if uh, you are self-described technologists. I think people in this space have been asking for this for a long time. It seems natural that Apple would be early to the space. I say early because it. I think this is a movement. I think this is a thing. Um, I, I think you and I sh uh, share a passion for uh, this crazy practice of planned obsolescence in consumer hardware. You know, you use Bose headphones for two years. The warranty lasts for one. Now you've got, uh, you know, I don't know, earmuffs, very, very expensive earmuffs. W what's your view on um, consumer hardware as a service? So I think there's two competing pieces to all of it. Um, one is that uh, we, we kind of naturally fall into this anyway. There's kind of a natural upgrade cycle that we have for our devices, um, or at least in terms of my consumption of devices. And you, you even see that in some of the, the business models, you know, from the major like telco carriers, like on a phone, you can literally like lease your phone and that lease lasts for two years. Um, and then you get the next greatest phone, right? It's like baked into the pr your monthly price of your, your service plan. So uh, I think there's that piece that is already kind of relevant to the economics of how people consume these things anyway. Um, I think the bigger thing that people care about is having control over their own device, that you're not going to have the rug pulled out from under you, that you own the actual data. And, and so I think you have to trade off some of these core policy decisions around it. And then, you know, making sure that like, as, as an end consumer, I don't want it to be just like a, a money grab. <laughs> um, like I want the economics to actually be in my favor so that I end up with a better service at a cheaper price. And if you can't achieve that, then I think it's it's not actually serving the customers uh, appropriately. Okay, let's derail for a second. So uh, economics in your favor, streaming services. This feels mm -hmm. solid. You talk about this is the classic as a service model. Uh, yeah. content as a service. One of the things that um, this feels totally untenable. I mean, everything is a service now. I think that there's a lot of people that tried to watch the Super Bowl only to realize that NBC is now as a service, you know, and uh, I was one of those people. And now, you know, have to, there's this Peacock app and I'm like, are they, do they really have enough content to justify being as a service? We're very far away from, I understand, Travis and Cobalt's specialty, but this does not feel aligned with what you just pointed out, that you know the consumer needs to have some value. Um, th this is a walled garden pro proliferation strategy gone, run amok, it feels to me. Your thoughts on the matter? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're, you're right. The customer experience for having dozens of streaming services is not particularly good. And I, I'm in the same boat. I, I couldn't watch the Super Bowl. I like literally didn't have the ability to without signing up for some some brand new uh, additional streaming service. But I, I think you know, as we go away from broadcast to on demand, like being able to pull up any show to watch on any device, I think that's that's the long term end state of where we need to get. And we just have these like legacy licensing and distribution infrastructure that we're trying to like shoehorn all of that into. But in the limit, you know, there should be the content creators who are going to be able to monetize the content that they've created. Um, and then me as an end consumer should be able to pull that content on demand for the ones that I want to watch. And it, it shouldn't need um, necessarily these giant walled gardens in the same way that like, you know, for past cable companies, it was like whatever, whatever happened to be being broadcast at that time is where you're viewing options. And that's obviously a subpar experience as well. And so I think a lot of these things are a natural evolution over many, many years, um, which for me, it's really hard to be patient. <laughs> um, like I, I want that future now. It's so obvious that that end state is, is the way it's going to be. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that there's some, you know, up and coming technologies that make this better and easier, right? Like there's a whole bunch on the crypto space that I think are fascinating that people are exploring um, to do decentralized content creation and consumption. Um, 
but yeah, the existing systems are great in that they have this crazy level of flexibility, but they're also really bad at just the number, the number and variety of, of options. Yeah. I just strongly agree. Um, I, w I should probably reel us back in uh, to robotics a little bit, or they're going to run me off this show. One of the things that is, I think, fascinating about COBOL is you guys solved a, you know, we talk a lot on this show about the wrong side of impossible. You, you know, to do important things, you have to solve some kind of problem that nobody else has solved before. For you guys, it it feels like this was this doorknob articulation piece. I'm going to say it wrong, but you know, I think broadly, that's uh, the ability to move through doors and corridors and things. It it it. I wanted to pull two things out of you on this. One, talk about like it seems to be the type of problem that unless you're experiencing it, you don't realize how important it is. Like I could see this being difficult to pitch to customers unless they understood that this was a unique, a massively uh, important differentiator. And two, you know, at what point did you guys realize as a company, hey, we're not going to be able to, you know, scale this thing and go crazy without solving this particular seemingly very specific issue? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So, you know, th this idea of a, of a security robot actually goes all the way back to the mid-1960s. Very first mobile robot ever was this robot called Shaky out of Stanford. And literally one of its intended use cases was security. So this is a super old idea. And in fact, Hewlett Packard in the 1980s had like a robot following a buried wire to do Firewatch. So this is like a super old idea that has only become economically viable in like the last five to 10 years. Um, and so really for us, it, it comes down to like, how do you marry the, the current state of technology with a service that can be both cost effective and valuable? And there were two really big sort of impossible things that we solved. Um, number one is doors and elevators. So our robots mostly operate in, in inside indoor environments. Um, and to do that, they need to be able to move through the entirety of a building unencumbered. And the biggest limitation for indoor robots today is how do you traverse doors and elevators to cover the entire building? And so when we first started off doing this, uh, we, we relied on, you know, doing API updates to the elevators to actuate the doors, all of these like Herculean uh, building modifications. And I think in the limit, right, if you fast forward like 20 or 30 years, we will modify our buildings for the benefit of robots. But that can't be like, we can't wait 20 or 30 years for that to happen. And so uh, we, we added some very simple capabilities on the robot where we just put this like tiny little arm, very Dalek-like if you're a Doctor Who fan. That, that like reaches out and just like pokes the elevator buttons and can like poke a handicap button. And, you know, it, it all started as just like, I bet my co-founder like a hundred bucks that he couldn't do it in like a week. And he put it together in like two days um, and had this like really simple prototype. I mean, it was super hacky, but like had it up and running. And we realized like we became at that point, the very first commercial robot capable of traversing an unaugmented elevator. And it was profound for our economics. And so we were able, like in mid-2020, we started rolling these systems out. And it, it completely changes the game in terms of the ROI. Like now one robot can cover an entire building instead of just one floor. And so this was a huge deal for us. You know, similar story on doors. We have some unique things coming down the pipe that will let us just reach out and open a door. Um, and so those are, those are some really important capabilities that just allow robots to, to be more effective while the rest of the world sort of catches up and starts augmenting the world for the benefit of robots. And so that was a big part. The other big one was uh, cultural adoption. When I first started out, my biggest concern for COBOL is whether both the security end user as well as building occupants would be receptive to having a five foot tall mobile robot moving through their space, right? And we spend a lot of time to make sure we do the change management and the cultural onboarding through things like, you know, uh, lunch and learns, email communications, video communications, robot naming contests, like all of this white glove handholding that goes in to make sure that people know what the robot is, why it's there and how it benefits them. And that's true regardless of whether they'll ever interact with it. 
right? And so it's making sure that people know that like the robot's not spying on you. It's not doing facial recognition. It's not scary. Look, you can come up and tap the screen and a human being will come on the other side and talk to you. Uh, and it's about providing like people with the, the comfort of mind to onboard these very new, very visible technologies. And so it's a combination of deep, deep technology pieces, as well as these deep operational cultural pieces um, for, for enhancing and, and modifying behavior and operations. You've mentioned five feet tall a couple of times, which is like a very specific uh, yeah. call out. Did you guys discover in the process of developing this that like seven feet was ominously terrifying and three feet was too easy to trip over? I mean, how did you get, why five feet? Yeah, so this was actually really important. Um, we remember that I said we didn't want we wanted a solution that was software only. So in an ideal world, we would not be developing our own hardware, right? We wish that there was just a commodity hardware platform that we could tie into and use for this purpose. But the simple reality was there isn't. Like there, when you start looking at the security application, uh, there's a whole bunch of specifications that you need to meet in order to provide a good, capable service. So for example, uh, just to be able to navigate around a human environment, luckily for indoors, we know exactly what specifications we need to meet. We follow the ADA compliance. The Americans with Disabilities Act basically tells you the requirements that an electric wheelchair needs to be able to traverse a building. Um, when you think about the specific location and placement of the sensors, right? Like the robot needs to be five feet tall so it can see out over cubicle farms. And it needs to be able to be both tall enough, but short enough to interact with, with people coming up and, and looking at someone on the screen. And so we took all of these specifications, and then we worked with this world-famous industrial designer named Eve Behar uh, to go through and design a robot that was not scary. It's not Terminator. It's not Robocop. It's more like WALL-E or Big Hero 6 or something, right, where it's friendly and approachable. And uh, because most of the time, you're you are having customer service engagements with people who are supposed to be in the space. And so we really wanted a system that could fit into like a high-end office environment, but also like a, you know, dirty and dangerous manufacturing facility or warehouse facility. Um, and so it's, it's all of this like nuanced engineering to make that entire system work and be effective and then be culturally uh, relevant. Interesting. Wow. I, I thought it was just going to be, you know, those were the parts that were available. So there sounds like a lot of thought went into it. You know, I was write, writing down some of the key takeaways from today. Um, I, I want to go through these with you. One, I haven't heard this before, but the idea of starting with some criteria of what you were looking for in a business seems very unique. And, and you mentioned early paying customers, software only, which uh, interestingly, you guys did not achieve success at, um, and doing something that, well, I'm, I'm, these are my words, doing something that you love, doing something you could see yourself still doing in 10 years. Cause I, any startup worth doing is a 10 year commit. Um, that's, that feels powerful to me. I like, is that something that you've shared with other people looking back now? Do you feel like that was, um, just give me like a lightning answer. Like if that, that philosophy and its ability to guide you looking back now, important, not important? I think it was extremely important. And we, to be clear, we, we cribbed some of that from my time at Google X. I was part of the rapid eval group that would help surface and vet new ideas for Google X, you know, they're like moonshots division to pursue. And they had their own specific criteria that were a bit different. Um, and so Eric and I took a very disciplined approach to how we thought about applications. Um, and those were the criteria that, that we thought were most representative for creating, a, you know, a, a hyper growth, substantial, uh, world impacting um, application. Any technology company worth its salt has has to make hard decisions, had to make brutally hard decisions in the early days. And I find that frameworks help. I think that's why the, I find this so intriguing. You guys were looking for problems to solve. And it's really easy to start talking your what yourself into something. Um, frameworks, you know, you have to look at that and say, okay, you know, this is the framework we've applied. It just doesn't work here. I, it also strikes me that you guys looked for a large market. This one sounds obvious. A lot of people get it wrong. $50 billion security guard market. 
that's that's a big juicy market um i see a lot of people talking about like the evolution of the labor force um you know workers rights i think is something on a lot of people's minds security guard there's some danger there um healthcare of course becoming more and more expensive so that that feels uh important like an important call out that i'm not sure a lot of people pay attention to early on Finding product market fit, you guys seem to have not been security experts and also not particularly picky about where the the search led you. Is that a fair characterization that this could have just as easily landed in a different market if that's where the opportunity was? Yeah, and in fact, we, we went through something like 30 to 50 different uh, opportunities when we were doing that exploration. So security wasn't the only one that we, we looked at. Security just happened to be this case where, one, having access to world domain experts was really helpful to help guide our product development and our understanding and learning um, within that industry. Because we're still not, like, I'm still not a security expert. Like, you, you grab a chief security officer, you know, from any of our clients, and they have more security expertise in their pinky finger than I do my whole body. So we are building tools that make them more effective. And so that's, that's our superpower is marrying the current state of the art and technology with like the deep understanding of those end users. Um, but yeah, we, we did literally look at like 50 different uh, opportunities. Some of them were good, some weren't. And then it was really, it was also really important to marry the type of business model and the type of business with the right capital source, because some companies are going to be better as a venture backable hyper growth and others are going to be more like private equity. Um, private equity opportunities. And so Eric and I both had experience within the venture community, had deep contacts there. And so this one was also one that we could, you know, reasonably achieve funding to, to pursue. I'm going to have you back on the show another day to talk about um, life with a co-founder. I recommend it. Uh, don't take the bait for today because we're running out of time, but there's a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, I think that feel uh, a strong drive to, it be their thing. You know, I, I know Zuckerberg had co-founders, but it was kind of the Zuckerberg show. Most people can't name any of the other co-founders. Um, I'm a believer in it. Save that thought for next time. I'm going to ask you next time we have you on the show, what you, what your thoughts are. Of course you have, he's going to be listening. So you're not going to want to say too many terrible things, but there's pros and cons. And I think there's a lot to consider on both sides for folks out there looking to, to start their company. Um, Couple rapid fire observations. Consumer hardware, folks, it is coming as a subscription service near you. I, I think when we look back from the vantage point of 2020, let's call it end of year Christmas season 2024, um, I, I think this is just going to be the default that people have signed up for Bose headphones as a service, whatever as a service. Uh, so I'll plant the flag on that now. Streaming service, uh, we, I think, are of like mind that this is untenably crowded. I'm very curious to see how that plays out. And finally, solving hard problems is critical to having a company. You don't have a company if you haven't solved the hard problem. But I think the Cobalt story is that it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you don't have to completely reinvent a thing. You know, you guys didn't invent robotics or security, but this articulation piece was something that others had not been able to solve for. It doesn't seem huge to an outsider, but I can't. In hearing you tell the story, I could see where it is huge from the customer side. You've got to be able to get into the conference room in these various different rooms. And that piece unlocked a huge market for you guys. I think if you're out there in the audience listening, that that's probably a key takeaway. It's a key takeaway for me, at least, that you're looking for these glimmers of light and you hit them with everything you got. Okay, let's nail this articulation piece. And finally, it strikes me, and, and we've heard this repeatedly on the show, you don't have a company if you're not solving a hard, important problem, important to the customer. Um, and, and time and again, you know, we, we see uh, companies come and talk about this. But I think what people miss often is that it doesn't have to necessarily be a total reinvention of the wheel. You, Cobalt did not invent robotics. It did not invent security. It didn't invent security as a service. Um, but you, this articulation piece, you found, Hey, look, this is extremely important. Outsiders may not appreciate it, but people, you know, that are in building operations absolutely see it for what it is. And they say, these guys are able to get into the conference room. These guys are able to get into the different restrooms, different corners of the building because they can open and close doors.
doors, they can operate the elevator. That is a significant, though not enormous, um, differentiator. And I, I think for the audience, that's probably the biggest takeaway of the day, for me at least, that if you're out there and you're looking, you feel like you found the opportunity that you want to go after, you feel like you've got the strategy, I'd be asking myself, what is the thing that we're doing that's unique and different that really sets us apart that's incredibly valuable for the company, uh, for the customer? If you've got that, I think you've got your, your opportunity has legs. If you don't, I think maybe you're not quite there yet. Exactly. Well, Travis, that's, uh, that's it for today. I got a couple of lightning questions for you on the way out the door. Number one, uh, Cobalt. I'm a big fan. I think some of the people listening today probably are fans. W what's, uh, what are you guys up to next? What are we going to see in the next couple of months out of Cobalt? For us, it's a lot of uh, a lot of the same. It's rolling out robots all over the world. Like we have robots in many different countries already. Um, obviously, the the door and elevator thing is is still an ongoing challenge that we we push more and more uh, capabilities towards the edge. And then, yeah, fundamentally, I think you know over the next few years, you're going to see this really big change across how buildings are managed and operated. And it's not just safety and security facilities; it's janitorial. It's out of stock and inventory, nursing assistance, last door delivery, not just last mile delivery, um, you know, lawn care, um, window washing, all of these things are going to be automated over the next few years. And you're seeing massive uptake in, in those capabilities. Last question. It's one of my favorites. I'm a big fan of the IoT space. I've dedicated my career to this space. I know you're a super fan, self-described technologist. What are some IoT companies out there? doing great work that you think more people should be talking about, or at least companies that you personally are a fan of? Yeah, I mean, obviously I have a lot of uh, con deep connections into the robotics ones. And so of those applications I mentioned, you know, there's Diligent Robotics, Sky Current, Electric Sheep, Zippity, like there's a, a handful of them that do these, these building automation. Um, as you look at more traditional, like, you know, uh, IoT devices, folks like SafeTrust, are doing amazing things in terms of wireless access control and 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 building sensing, um, even home healthcare monitoring. Companies like Stell and and others. Uh, I think these things are going to transform the way in which we live our lives and the way in which our our spaces are adapted for for people, um, and really letting the technology fill the gaps where people do the things that people are good at and technology everywhere else. Yeah, I love that version of history and and uh, or the future, and I hope that's the one that we get. You know, I think it's very alluring this idea that there's jobs that just aren't that attractive, and if we can free people up to do the ones that you know are very intriguing, it's the best possible version of the future. Travis, uh, for folks that want to follow the story, where's a good place to to follow you on the interwebs? Yeah, for Cobalt Robotics, uh, it's just cobaltrobotics.com. And then for me, uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place to connect. Okay, folks, we'll link to it in the comment section when we post this episode. Uh, but he is Travis Dial, D-E-Y-L-E. -E. Look him up on LinkedIn. Um, if you've got questions, fire it his way. I'm sure he'd be happy to field those. Travis, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. And thank you for listening. Join us next time we meet another IoT executive. We're going to be talking about stuff that went wrong on the journey to what went right. See you guys on the internet.